Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tudor, and uh, thank you for the Innovating Society for my uh, invitation to speak. I met at the last meetup and I said what I do, and, and Tudor said, oh, that's really interesting, and wow, could you speak for me? Uh, can you come speak? And I, I love giving talks. I just love giving back and inspiring people. That's what I do for my career, is to inspire people and get them thinking, and get them thinking in a different way. I was asked to say, to ask, I was asked what I would talk about. Um, I spent the last 20 years working in design and branding and innovation um, as a futurist. Um, so why not talk about designing for the future? It was really nice to know that there's a really eclectic group of, of, from different fields, from design and education and marketing uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, because what I talk about touches everyone and there are tools that you can use. I'll give some case studies from my, uh, from my past and, and how we, I, we've applied different approaches uh, to solving different problems. I'm based in Amsterdam, Finnish Canadian, and I've been here for the last two months working on a project, a branding project. Before I was on the same one for seven months, working as uh, service design. And it's a brilliant team, brilliant project, so I'm really happy. I've fallen in love with Bucharest and Romania, so buona sera. And uh, multimesc. So, yes, I'm an anthropologist. I have a, uh, my past, or my, my uh, profession is an anthropologist, uh, but I started working in a team of social science scientists with designers. So I've worked in futures. Um, and through my work, have been really closely linked to design, and from that become a service designer. Agile coach, uh, working with different teams to get them thinking in a different way, um, coaching them from a strategic point of view, from design strategy, corporate strategy, marketing strategy, um, and service design. And what I do is I help companies, organizations, groups navigate the future to understand where things are going. And I like this quote from the Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan. It says, we look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backward into the future. Our futures are always experienced and frequently determined by a past that few of us fully acknowledge and understand. And I usually look at this when I start any project is really to understand the past, what are the past behaviors, what are the past problems, observe the, uh, observe the present, see what's happening in society, social, cultural trends, behaviors, in order to design for the future. I started my company, my design research company in, in London in 2008. And it was a time that Obama was being inaugurated for the first time, and I was sitting with a friend in Soho House in London, trying to figure out a name. And he said something about Created Equal, and I said, hey, that's what I do. I think that what Tudor said as well is when you have a community of people getting together with different thoughts, different perspectives. All our brains are trained differently from our culture, from our education. When you have this synergy of different ideas and different perspectives, you come up with the best solution. Whether you're a designer sitting with a marketer or a, a chef or a, an engineer, you all talk different languages, but together you can create the best solution. Just a bit of background. So my background's from Nokia. Uh, that's where I started my career. Really look at annual trends and sociocultural trends, working on very innovative future projects, uh, for example, gaming, future of gaming, future of multimedia, fashion, all of these things that aren't necessarily to do with technology, but we brought the outside in. This is happening in fashion. This is how it could be translated into an app or an application. Um, and from there, working very closely with design, uh, designing and concepting and innovation. In my, uh, uh, when I had my consultancy in London and now, I, I restarted my consultancy in Amsterdam. Work with Bang & Olufsen to look at kind of uh, media and how uh, homes are changing. So it's a whole project around how technology and homes are, are now 
being transformed into these media hubs. And so they created a whole ecosystem based around our, our designs. Uh, Herman Miller, I'll talk about that later. Absolute Vodka did a project with them. What, what is a future drink? Um, M&S Food, Microsoft, and, and some others. Um, yeah, and then Dell. I, I was five years as a futurist for Dell. I just need to take a little drink. Which is really exciting. Dell is an exciting company because they're... Their consumer products are, are quite small. It's a small division. It's about a billion or something, but their business-to-business -business products are huge. They're leading in the medical industry, in education, uh, in military, in government, and that's where a lot of the, the, the products that they make are focused on that. So our team started at Amsterdam. It was an advanced design team for, for Dell, looking, two, or looking three, five, ten years ahead. So the education, I did the future of education and then worked with the strategy and the design team to look at new solutions for uh, education for classrooms. Um, of course, uh, this was a, a, a favorite project of mine. It was a military, uh, it goes on to the front, front lines of uh, military. So how that's designed for that usage. So all of these based on the same, um, same process basically that we look at uh, designing. Sorry, I just got this clicker, so I'm not used to it. And at, at the moment, I work for Nordcap. Nordcap is a, uh, a Finnish design agency um, looking at service design and product design, really helping corporations uh, look at tomorrow and beyond. Uh, they've done work for the automotive uh, industry, so automotive parts um, and uh, then so is uh, that. Uh, we did an interesting project for BDR Thermia, which is um, a boiler, so a heater in the home. And I was just excited because I'm always excited when I get to go into fields I never thought of. And I go, yeah, a boiler has to be designed. But not even that, we we're working with the installers who need some sort of application when they're on the road. And how are they going to interact with the people in the home? How are they going to interact with the boiler? It's really fascinating when you can go into a field and you go, I never thought of that. Oh yeah, that has to be designed. Um, and of course, uh, I, uh, ING, where I'm working now. Uh, also, uh, very much uh, building or designing the best in class digital products and experiences. They did a project for, uh, called Bedit, which uh, is this, uh, to help you sleep and it monitors your sleep. Um, as well as the Aura, uh, the Aura Smart Ring. The Aura Smart Ring uh, also monitor, uh, monitors your well-being and gi gives all that information back to you uh, uh, through data analytics. So that was just a brief history of what I've done. Uh, I've, I've really been privileged to, uh, in my career to work with very talented and interesting people and on interesting projects because I, I think that everything is designed. Everything in this room has been designed, it's been planned, it's been thought through. How would that fit into people's lives? So uh, the next slide is anyway. So I was thinking anything needs to be designed. So I worked on a project with Mars Chocolate um, and even because it, it, when you talk to people about design, they always think, oh, it's this high end design, but we design anything. An ashtray has to be designed, how it's going to work, where you're going to put your cigarette. Chocolate, this was an interesting project because we were designing the new chocolate for, and it was based, it was marketed for women. And because the whole, uh, the whole idea behind this chocolate was, was, was old, so we had to look how, how women's lives are changing and, and what they're doing and, and how their lives are changing in work and how they're resting at home. So not only did we design the, uh, the shape of the chocolate through a lot of conceptual workshops, but really looking at the social cultural trends that are imp impacting them. And also, because how are you going to approach them with packaging, colors, materials, um, communication? And so these all link together. And when we design something, I always say that it has to be that red thread that goes through all of the different touch points. So, where, but where do you begin? 
That's the question. Where do you begin? I say you don't begin with the data. Data is something bo uh, booking.com does it, but we have already seen how, how websites and interfaces have just become sterile and uh, there's nothing new coming out of them because they're not looking at the, the, the human approach. The human approach to design is, is, is not there at the moment, or it's, it's just becoming through all of this data. So I, I say it's all about people. It's, about, it's observing those people and, and, and their needs or, or like everyday life. This is an interesting, and all these, all these photos you'll see here is a collection of my life here in Bucharest. Um, different places that I've been, I've been ob observing you while I'm here to think of new innovation and new design. Now even this, uh, watching these fishermen uh, in the park and then how they set everything up and then thinking, oh, is there a new solution that could be possibly, can you design something that would help them in, in any way? And I, I, I love this picture because it's just all about people. That's who we design for. That's how we innovate. That's how we make programs or organizations to help people. It's always thinking, how can we plan? How can we design something? When I say design, it's designing a program, maybe an educational program or, an, or a curriculum, but you have to look at the people and the people's lives and how it best fits them. Medical, um, cuisine, everything, hospitality, everything is designed because we have to think how best it will fit into their lives. And how do we do that? It's through empathy. It's by putting yourself in the people's shoes. And sometimes it's very difficult because you have people that, it's not that you don't connect with, but they live totally different lives. And there was a, an interesting, so I use a lot of work, I do a lot of workshops and, and persona is a really good tool. And sometimes you really have to be stereotypical. And I, I, at Dell, I created all these personas, I think, I think it was eight. We were doing the next design direction, next design language. And one of the designers, Sung, um, he, he said to me, he goes, yeah, but, none of these people exist. I said, no, this is 70% based on information. This is about 70% of the world's population. But Sung, you go to a certain type of restaurant, you go to certain areas, he's a designer, and so he's in his own bubble. But we can't design for designers, we have to design for people. So we really have to kind of stretch, stretch our imagination. How do we do that? Is having empathy. Empathy is not, not enough. We do need to, to be rigorous. And design thinking and agile thinking is all about tools. It's about processes. It's about first exploring, really thinking widely. You know, what, what are the possibilities? Opening it up to anything, uh, social, cultural trends, uh, behaviors, needs, challenges. And then we discover, then we kind of hone in on, on what are the insights? And so many times I'm in workshop. Even I have, everyone has assumptions. Not even I, everyone has assumptions. And I go, I never thought of that. I thought all people do it like this. And you go, wow. So then you start to discover. And after that, you start to define what, you're, what you will design. And all these processes we've always done. So I don't know how many are familiar with the double diamond. Double diamond is really much used in design thinking, it's used in design. So it's really much about a process and you, it's not even double diamond, you should go on and on. Design, innovation, thinking is iterative. You always build on the thoughts that you had. You always build more and then until you get to that, that gem or that sweet spot. So you start to first diverge in all directions and then here you start putting lens or a filter. I call them lenses, make it more uh, clear what you want to see. But you start converging on your thoughts. That doesn't belong to what we're looking at, so that's out. It's like a, a microscope, so you're going in. And then you get to, uh, to the thought or to the concept that you're looking, looking for. We all have assumptions. We open all the assumptions that we have, and sometimes we have to be really critical. We have to, you know, uh, think of stereotypes as well. The only way we can uh, get rid of stereotypes is really talk about them and say, well, actually, that's not right. We come to a hypothesis after, after we 
converge, we come to a hypothesis and once again open it up to new scenarios. Create a bunch of scenarios that some might be way blue sky thinking, some might be more, more realistic. But to have an array of these scenarios, because what you do next is then you, once again, you converge on your thoughts, and then from that you can come up with the concept that best suits the problem or the, the research question or the problem. This goes to scientific research as well. This goes to education as well. So you always open up to the possibilities and constantly going down. In a repetitive, iterative process where you keep on learning. But you need tools, so you have trend management, you have ethnography, you have personas, and these uh, pay, uh, play a really key role in innovation and design. It is structured. I did a pro project on, on creativity, uh, ethnography around the world. And a lot of people think uh, creatives are all out there like this, and they're very structured. It's about using one tool and then moving to another tool to another tool. It's about a process. And innovation is the same. Nothing just pops up. It, it comes through hard work, hard thinking, and slowly you get to that point. Writing a book, writing a thesis, same thing. But it really does... Uh, what innovation, in my point of view, is about... It encompasses anything newly created that has on, uh, an impact on the world. So a small adjustment to something could be an innovative way. Never thought of that. Oh, that's new. But it's something that exists, but you've created something, added something, that it changes, and it changes to something. I love this photo because there are so many innovative things that you could see there. They all have a need. They're going somewhere. They're going to church. But they all have some sort of need. The sellers also have a need. But there is an innovative thought. Oh, I'll set up a table here. So when you talk, think about innovation or design, it's not designing a product or it's not designing a service. It could be just innovating or designing something that is something good for someone. It betters their life. But it is understanding. So once again, it's really taking what you see and how it fits and how it fits into their behaviors and how best fits into their lives to create that opportunity. And this way we can get a clear, uh, a clear vision of the future. Everything we design is in the future. One minute is in the future. So when we think of future, we don't have to think three, five, ten years. It could be immediate future as well. How can we do something that changes to make an impact that changes something that there's a challenge or a friction? And that's why I love what I do, and that's why it's exciting, because there's so many things that you can find that you can improve. The world would be boring if we didn't have to improve anything. But I, I always say it's about informed intuition. Informed intuition is a concept I created or I thought of because I was giving a, a lecture in the Buenos Aires Design University and I said that informed intuition, its informed part is all of the information, the education, the culture you come from, the people you talk to, the media you watch on television or listen to the radio, subconsciously we get all this information. And at one point, all of they collate, and through that synergy, you go, that's it. It could be anything. It could be uh, in hospitality, it could be a chef, it could be uh, designing, it could be education. Oh, it, that's it. And you get those aha. But it's informed intuition. And those come from all of these, all of these bits of information that you get, that you're inspired by. And that's how we design the future well. So, I say believe in the process. And I know for a fact, I think every single project I've been on, there's that moment, and you probably have been here as well, is that you're going, oh shit, this is not gonna go anywhere. I have absolutely no idea where this is going. This, this I don't even know why they have me here. This is, I, I, I have no idea. And then you just persist, and then it comes. All of the points come together once you just keep on going through, and then you go, aha, that's it. It was there all along, but then you get it. And so I say, I always say, 
to the teams I work with. Just believe in the process, it will come. We just have to go through all of the stuff. So, just uh, I'll go through some examples of innovation in design. I think this is the most innovative com uh, company who has been around. Does anyone know this company? It started in 1868 in a small village. No? Maybe you know these. Maybe you know this product. This is from the 1960s. So very innovative, going from pulp and paper to rubber and, and wiring, uh, televisions and toilet paper. Um, then they went to, at one point, into rubber, rubber boots. They teamed up with a company uh, called Gondio, which uh, is a, a, a soft name for a bear that they used in the Middle Ages, um, because bear was a deity then, and so it was, a, it was soften uh, the words. Gondio means that. 1973, they started selling, they still sell these. Uh, once again, innovation, taking this, which is the Nokia rubber boot from 1973, a friend, uh, from Finsk, designed, so taking an existing rubber boot and doing it a, a top in fashion, uh, designed for uh, women to have rubber boots to protect them in the winter. So once again, a small thing, a small thought, changed one product to another, but yeah. This is what you'll know it as, Nokia. So Nokia is not a new company, it's been around since 1868, constantly reinventing itself, constantly finding innovation and looking in different areas. In the 1990s, then they had divested their televisions, uh, their television division, their rubber boot division, uh, their, their car tire division, and focused solely on, on telecommunications. Well, this is where my career started. I started at Nokia in a, in a team of social scientists working closely with uh, design, and worked on a lot of them. Oops. Uh, we had the fashion phones. Uh, so we had the gaming phone. We had the phone for youth, the, the business. Really innovative ideas and designs focused on people and how it fits into different uh, people's lives and, and for function. But this is what I want to talk about. This uh, a project I worked closely on in 2002. Nokia launched the, the first ever uh, camera phone. In 2002, no one thought in the future they'd be walking around with one of these, taking pictures like I did every day, I don't know, hundreds of pictures. It wasn't, it wasn't in people's minds. Go, what? That wouldn't happen. Also, this phone was launched in 2002 as the first phone with a color screen. They didn't have any color screens before, so all of these small innovations also they become default, we don't even think of them. And now we have Instagram. So this kind of just turned into a whole new culture. We have the Instagram culture. This is from Dirty Bones. It's a restaurant in the UK where they give an Instagram pack to customers to take pictures of their food. Coffee is the most uh, Instagrammed by Dirty Bones in London. 60 million photos go through, so it's huge. But once again, it just that innovation, that small thinking, a vision of the future that people will be doing this. They had it in a minority report and people going, wow, in the future, can I do that? That was 2002. We had a project then to look in 2002 into the future, our team. We are tasked by the vice president to look uh, at 2003, 2005, and 2007 where imaging culture would go. We came up with four scenarios through a lot of work. Inner exposure was one. And I read it in 2008. I happened to found, find it. I got goosebumps and going, wow, we had everything from YouTube to kind of the new Instagram and all of these that were coming out. So by a process, it's, we can predict the future. We can look at the future for what will happen. But in addition to value, so the value for people, innovation must also kind of add novelty and change some behavior. So I always think that aside from being new, 
it has to do something that it changes the behavior. Worked on uh, Herman Miller, uh, approached us to do uh, the next, the future work desk. Uh, this is a really interesting project. They had the iconic Iona chair, and they wanted to do the, the work desk. I don't have any images because, of course, all the images are confidential when I work in design. But the process was really interesting. So first we looked at basically the sociocultural trends, what's shaping back then, what was shaping work culture to come. We already see that we looked back then at hub space, connected essentials, frictionless and easy echo, which is for you guys every day now. Back then it wasn't, and we took a, a group of executives and had them work three days, three or four days, I can't remember, in uh, Herman Miller's space in the UK. We were behind a glass and then we watched, it was fascinating, we watched their physical interactions. Of course, hearing them, but not, not interacting with them, just seeing what they are building nests, and we all do this. Some were putting their pictures, even though they are there for a few days. Some were building barriers, some were keeping it open so they can talk like this, how they're adjusting their equipment. Extremely fascinating, but on top of that, we did uh, in-depth interviews. So on top of understanding how they physically and, and their physical needs, we also looked into their psychological needs and came up with really interesting themes, which then were manifested in, in the design, uh, in the designs. So of course, the, this is just kind of the themes that new areas, uh, new ways of working, new, new ways of sitting, and, and, and the whole interaction that people have. But innovation is also, also expanding on, on existing products or products from the past, learning from them, really understanding uh, the tools of doing competitive analysis. And this is, you can do in any, in any industry. It's not just about technology or products, but it's about people and how people are working and, and how different brands are, 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 are working beside different brands or products or even organizations. So I work a lot also with branding organizations and looking about work culture, building that work culture based on, on work values. So yeah, so doing uh, a project uh, with Samsung on, 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 on a camera project, but looking first at what's out there and what can be improved and how people are using them and why. Are they prosumers? Are they just mass market? Are they just average users? So really looking at the usage, and this comes from a different angle. It's still thinking of people, but it's really their behaviors. And we could do this in a lot of ways. Um, once again, looking at, and then yeah, I created Hipster. So looking, uh, so looking at the kind of the social cultural trends that also impact not only what, what is out there, but also kind of impacting usage at that time and where society is going. I think this was for a Panasonic project of looking at uh, the future television and we did ethnography in homes based on kind of this home entertaining. As we know that I uh, did a lot of studies on home and the psychology of homes when the, this was the time of the crash. So whenever there's an economic downfall, people revert and we go into homes. Then home entertainment becomes very important, ordering in. I don't know how that's going to work because everyone orders in now with sex, ordering sex in, ordering food in. No one leaves home anymore. So I call it the takeaway culture. It's one of my trends. Everyone's just taking away everything, ordering it in. But that happens in homes. Um, but yeah, taking all that information, uh, using affinity walls, which is uh, a technique from a Japanese an anthropologist of how to, how to link these different ideas. So looking at kind of the physical objects that are out there, how people are using, what are the behaviors and sociocultural impacts, and then coming up with um, ideas. Companies that are considered innovative are the ones that foster and encourage curiosity. And I think curiosity is one of the key vital virtues of people. If you stop being curious, you're over. You know, you're curious to learn, you're curious to understand and wonder. 
And so curiosity, I think, is the core of innovation and design, is kind of thinking what will happen or what we can do. This is Royal Caribbean International. Uh, we worked with them in Miami to look at the, the cruise lines. Their fleet is already designed five, ten be years before because they have to with the technology and the leading technology and plus health and uh, sorry, safety on board. So that's all designed beforehand, but absolutely fascinating to be able to see behind and what happens in this industry as well, because I've never been. So we are tasked to look at what will be in the future, what will people do on these, on these ships, but really understanding the behaviors and based on the sociocultural behaviors, what will be. So looking how people will, um, what will happen on in, in entertainment, dining, uh, accommodations, um, on board these ships. Uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, uh, I use as an example because they're very, very innovative. They're very curious what could be. They're the first ones in the 60s or 70s to put an ice skating rink on a ship to build these, these big ships. And there's a lot of, of passengers. So the takeaways of this short, and we'll have a question and answer. I was just giving a, a, a broad view of different approaches. Um, I say that everything is designed, but only through informed intuition. Is it well designed? We can design poor things. Sometimes it happens. And there have been cases, you know, sometimes I was talking with a colleague today, uh, and sometimes there are uh, products that they just don't work. They weren't thought through, or maybe they were a brilliant idea, but uh, it, it missed, it missed the mark. So sometimes there are these products and innovations that, that don't. And that's fine. We're human. We make mistakes, but we can build on them and then improve them. It's all about people. So designing, innovating, it should always be about people. Believe in the process. There are processes that you go through and sometimes it is tedious, I know especially the beginning of a research project, when you have to do the analysis or you have to separate things. I have the letters that my, this is sidetrack, but it's still the same, of letters that my parents wrote their parents from Canada. They immigrated in 1960, so there weren't really phones. Nokia wasn't around there. And so they were sending letters, and so I have all those letters, and I have all the letters they sent to, to Canada. And the tedious task of, of doing the archiving so we do, have, we do have tedious tasks, but we have to persevere and believe in the process. The ideas always come. It's just, I always think it's amazing because sometimes you go, and then you walk away and you go, that's it. Collectively, I believe in working in teams, and it is a community. That's where you get the best thinking. Um, and it's a collective thinking. I don't think it's design thinking. It's collective thinking, and I think that's where we'll be heading more to a collective thinking because we, we just have different brains and different experiences. The last point is always be curious. There's always something you could learn from another person. Just talk to them because it, it really goes, wow, I never thought of that. Or you learn something new um, about yourself. And that's the most important. So I say, now shove off and design for the future. Multumask. Mm -hmm.